Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to talk to you about Van Allen belts, and more specifically, how dangerous they are. Now, the Van Allen belts were one of the first big discoveries of space science. The radiation belts trapped by the Earth's magnetic field were discovered by data from the very first satellite launched by the US, Explorer 1. And this satellite was launched in 1958. It contained a Geiger counter which was expected to see cosmic rays. And sometimes it would report about 30 counts per second, but at other times the rate would show a zero. And this perplexed the scientists, including a certain James Van Allen. The reason behind this was because due to limitations in the early guidance technology, the spacecraft was in an elliptical orbit with an apogee above 2,500 kilometers. They figured out that it, when the zero counts happened when the spacecraft was high up, above 2,000 kilometers. And eventually, a later mission, Explorer 3, would show that this region, the count rate was simply so high that it was saturating the detector on Explorer 1. The second outer radiation belt was discovered at the end of 1958 by Pioneer 3. This was intended to fly to the moon, but a malfunction in the Juno 2 rocket left it without the needed velocity. It reached an altitude of about 100,000 kilometers before falling back to Earth 38 hours later. But it was the first spacecraft to travel so far with a Geiger counter, and it detected the rise and the fall of the particle counts as it crossed through those outer belts. Ultimately, it became clear that this radiation belt was potentially hazardous, both to spacecraft and to humans who might travel beyond low Earth orbit. But just how dangerous are they? Obviously, the crews of the Apollo missions were able to complete their missions, even although certain uh, conspiracy-minded people claim the belts are so deadly that they would kill a human in mission minutes. I mean, I guess everybody dies after minutes, a very large number of minutes. But as far as we can tell, Apollo astronauts have not been dying young. So thanks to spacecraft studies, we actually have a pretty good idea of the shape of the belts and the radiation within them. Roughly speaking, the inner belt is dominated by protons, but has some population of electrons. And this inner belt is centered probably around 3000 kilometers above the Earth. The outer belt is much wider. It consists of relativistic high energy electrons, and it is centered around 19,000 kilometers out. And between these belts, there is actually a low intensity region, which is called the slot region. And sometimes we actually see electrons getting pushed into this region by solar activity, but it's cleared out. And the clearing process apparently involves low frequency radio waves at about one kilohertz, which interact with the particles and you know, push them out and they get lost. So anyway, the protons in the inner belt, those are believed to come from high energy cosmic rays that strike the Earth's atmosphere and they kick out protons and neutrons. And the neutrons decay after traveling through the magnetic field and they end up getting uh, trapped as protons and electrons. The electrons in the outer belt, those generally come from the solar wind as it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. Some of those electrons get trapped and they create the outer belt. And some, of course, then they'll subsequently get accelerated to relativistic speeds by the magnetic fields. So the outer belt's intensity varies a lot with the solar wind. Back in 2012, the Van Allen probes, which were just launched, they observed a temporary third belt in between the inner and outer belts. And then a week later, they observed a massive solar storm blast that blew away both those outer belts and just left the inner belt for a time. So the belts are constrained by Earth's magnetic field. And since the magnetic pole is not aligned with the rotation planes, the belts aren't actually aligned with the Earth's geographical equator. The magnetic fields of the Earth create a sort of magnetic bottle which stop the charged particles from escaping. Because charged particles in a magnetic field, they move along the magnetic field lines. They actually spiral along the magnetic field lines. And so if you imagine the field lines running from the North Pole to the South Pole, the particles travel up either towards one pole or the other. But as the magnetic field lines get pinched towards a po the pole, that increases the magnetic field. And so the 
uh, particles, they spiral and then they get pushed backwards by this strengthening magnetic field. So what happens is the particles spiral back and forth between each pole. Also, because the particles are just following the geometry of the Earth's magnetic field, there are regions where the field brings that inner belt down closer to the surface of the Earth. And there's a well-known region called the South Atlantic Anomaly, where the inner edge of the inner Van Allen belt pushes down into low Earth orbit. And spacecraft in regular orbit have to be aware of this because you'll sometimes get an error there. And if you look at mission control for the International Space Station, there's the big world map up there showing the current orbit. And you will also see the South Atlantic anomaly is marked on that map because it is associated with things going wrong. I mean, for the astronauts, when they go through that, they'll get uh, doses of hundreds of particles per second, but it's not a great deal when you look at the overall dose. The average dose of a, an astronaut on the space station is about 20 millirads per day. Um, but this, of course, varies a lot over time. Either way, the crew on the International Space Station are generally well within the limits set down by radiation safety rules. And I'm actually going to stop right here and say that modeling radiation exposure to people is actually a really complicated subject. And I'm going to talk using RADs. But in reality, the US uses REMS and international organizations use GRAYS and sieverts. And I'm going to use RADS mostly because it's really easy to say, but just understand that it is an oversimplification and, you know, more, more judgment or data needs to be done if you're going to apply any of this realistically. So now to get on to just how dangerous those Van Allen belts are. And to do this, we're going to use computer models and we're going to put a hypothetical spacecraft in the most dangerous region of the belt, about 3000 kilometers above the equator, zero inclination orbit. This is close to the most intense regions of the inner belt. So we can use computer models of what's in the belt. The most popular one, I think, are called AP8 and AE8, that's P for protons and E for electrons. This model was developed in the 1970s based upon satellite data. Uh, there are better models that exist, including AP9, predictably. On top of that, we need to account for the spacecraft's orbit, so we need to calculate orbits. And we need to be able to convert the particles that we observe and their energies into a radiation dose. And that isn't trivial because you can't just take the number of particles and multiply them by a magic number. You have to account for the energies which are spread out and the different types of particles involved. And you also have to account for the effects of shielding, right? If you're in the spacecraft, you have a hull. And that isn't trivial because the effectiveness of a shield depends upon the type of particle and it depends upon the energy of the particle. And furthermore, the shielding itself can generate secondary radiation that also needs to be modeled. So the good news is all these different systems are actually modeled and handled for you on websites that are designed for people that design space missions. And the one that I'm using is the European Space Agency's Space Environment Information System, also known as SPENVIS. So if I place a hypothetical astronaut in a 3000 kilometer equatorial orbit with no radiation shielding, and then I model everything out, it tells me that that poor astronaut would be exposed to a whopping 26,000 rads per hour. And yes, that would be fatal inside an hour, but that is unshielded, no spacesuit, so they're going to die even faster just due to asphyxiation. So if you add a few meters of aluminium to represent the skin of a spacecraft, then the dose drops significantly. Lots of the exposure actually comes from low energy protons that are really easy to stop. For the Apollo program, the natural shielding of the walls of the spacecraft were calculated to be roughly equivalent to about seven millimeters of aluminium. And I know this because for Lunar Orbiter 1, they carried a radiation sensor to the lunar orbit and it had two windows on it. One was seven millimeters thick to represent what the astronauts would feel inside a spacecraft. And the other was one millimeter to measure the effects for astronauts on EVA. So if you add seven millimeters of shielding, the dose drops from 26,000 down to about 20 rads per hour. And that's obviously a huge improvement, but it will still kill you in a few days if you were stupid enough to carefully maneuver your 1960s Apollo spacecraft into the middle of the radiation belts and then sit there doing nothing.
I guess you could sit there and watch Chernobyl. So, let's come back to those conspiracy-minded people who claim that this level of radiation would make it impossible to go to the moon. Let's humour them. Let's simulate the orbit of a spacecraft headed from low Earth orbit out to the moon. This takes a few hours to cross all of the belts and beyond the outermost belts. And in those few hours, again, an unprotected human would receive about a million rads. But again, this is totally unprotected. If you add shielding, it makes a huge difference. It brings the dose down from 1 million to 3.6 which is actually pretty great given that it takes about 50 rad to start having visible short-term effects. It's even below the annual limits imposed on nuclear workers. But to be fair, we do have to double that because the crew will also need to come home via the same route. And you know these numbers, while mathematically correct according to the models, they're not accurate because I've been acting like Khan from Star Trek II thinking two-dimensionally. The orbit I used was in the equatorial plane, just like in Kerbal Space Program. It was close to the heart of the belts. But the radiation gets weaker as you move away from the equator. And most lunar transfer orbits will actually pass above or below the most dangerous regions. Just taking that simple orbit and adding an inclination of about 35 degrees, which many of the Apollo spacecraft did, uh, that drops the dose by a factor of 20 down to 0.18 rads. And I'm just doing the barest minimal math to find an orbit which evades the core of the belt. When NASA was sending the Apollo spacecraft to the moon, they had this in mind and they made plans to make sure their spacecraft would avoid this. So look, for all the intense radiation in the belts, there's actually no problem crossing them. You just have to spend as little time as possible in those belts and choose trajectories that avoid any of the dangerous parts. The real truth though, is that the radiation danger when going to the moon and further afield is from sources other than the Van Allen belts. Once you move outside the magnetic field of the Earth, you're exposed to high energy photons from the sun. And most of the time, this uh, proton flux is low enough to not be concerning. But the sun is active and it can have flare-ups and solar storms which can emit enough radiation in a short period of time to be really dangerous. For example, in August of 1972, a powerful solar storm occurred. And NASA was really fortunate that this occurred between Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 rather than during any of those missions. If there had been a mission in progress during this flare-up, the crew in their spacecraft would likely have had some symptoms of radiation sickness. But even worse, if it happened during an EVA on the surface of the moon, the suits wouldn't offer very much protection. And it's highly likely that that dose from that event could be fatal to an astronaut. Now, nearly 50 years on, we understand the dynamics of the sun a whole lot better. We have superior instruments for monitoring the solar weather and the solar atmosphere, but still predicting an, energ an energetic event like this days ahead is still beyond what we have. And so it really does come down to luck for going out to the moon. Now for even longer missions, there's actually another problem called uh, due to constant low level bombardment from cosmic rays. And these come out from outside the so our solar system. In fact, they come from outside the galaxy. It's not really a problem on lunar missions because those are sort of short enough. But if you're traveling to Mars, you're spending years in space. And that constant background of the cosmic rays is going to cause problems over time. So for really long missions, the spacecraft need to be designed so that they can handle this low background flux of cosmic rays and have some way to defend against a very powerful solar event. And so looking forwards, I hope that when Artemis starts sending crew to the moon in a few years time, uh, I'm hoping that the people behind it, the mission designers and the engineers, have plans to deal with all these effects. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.